Hello, Karen. Good morning, Matt. Hello, how are you? Good. Can you see me? I can. Ta da. Okay. All right. So we're just going to sit tight and be quiet for just a second, and then we'll start spot on at eight o'clock. Okay. All right, well, we are at the eight o'clock hour, almost on the, on the dot. And I would like to say good morning and welcome to each of you that have chosen to join us this morning. You're joining us for the fourth of a series of seven web seminars presented in partnership with the Dakota County CDA and Chamber Partners. Today's topic is employment legal considerations and management. Just a few housekeeping items for each of you. All participants are muted. Please submit your questions using the Q&A feature. The recording of the seminars will be hosted on the partner websites. Also, we are truly glad you are here. These are unprecedented times and the goals of these web seminars is really to provide valuable information for small businesses as you consider what it's gonna to take to be begin to bring your business moving it forward. My name is Karen Schaffhausen. I'm a business advisor for Open to Business. Today to discuss our topic is Matt Scott. With that, Matt, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you again for joining us and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Karen. Uh, my name is Matthew Scott. I'm an attorney with Doherty Melinda, Sofa Stills and Bauer in Apple Valley. We have 16 attorneys. I'm a business litigation attorney. I'm going to practice in employment law as well. And uh, I just want to thank the chambers, all the different chambers that are collaborating with this, as well as Karen uh, bringing it all together. It's really, I think, an example of how small businesses in our community um, all kind of collaborate to uh, teach each other and learn from each other. Um, so we're going to get dive right in. There's a lot to cover. I'm going to uh, move to the next slide. So we have a lot of different laws, and I just want to summarize kind of the things we're going to do. We're going to talk about the changing laws. We're going to talk about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. We're going to talk about unemployment insurance, um, protecting your Paycheck Protection Program forgiveness uh, on the back end of these loans. We're talking about coronavirus in the workplace, uh, and also some wage and hour considerations. Uh, for employees working from home. And then uh, probably the question some of you are wondering about, uh, can I be sued? And so we'll get to that as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide.
Now they're changing laws. Ch laws have changed in the last month. Uh, the existing laws have even been modified and are now uh, operating in a different way. Uh, so we have the Paycheck Protection Program. There have already been a lot of um, discussions around that in past webinars, and I'd encourage you to go back and, and take a look at those. Um, this is a, a very timely uh, topic. Uh, this is something that's happening daily. The banks are really dealing with a lot of applications. Uh, Wells Fargo even closed its applications down over the weekend uh, because of some issues it had with uh, prior uh, governmental contact. Uh, but the Families First Coronavirus uh, Response Act is another piece of legislation uh, that is really important to you and to your business. It's most important because it's important to your employees. Um, and there's just a lot to digest in these, these different laws. Uh, unemployment insurance has also changed, uh, and it's also been supplemented by federal legislation in the CARES Act. Uh, next slide. So the uh, Families First Coronavirus Response Act uh, has a number of different components. It has uh, laws within the law. Uh, and what you need to know as an employer uh, is that this matters to you because uh, your employees matter to you. Uh, we want to see them do well. We want to see them survive this and come out on the other side uh, able to come back to work. Um, it's also important to uh, ensure that your employees are staying home when they should be staying home. And if they have to stay home because you're, uh, you're a non-essential business in a, in a non-critical sector under the governor's order, uh, this provides a backstop for them uh, at least for, for two weeks and in some cases up to 12 weeks uh, if they're caring for uh, children or uh, a family member who is ill. So really there are two components of this. There's the paid sick leave for the employee uh, that provides up to $511 a day uh, for really 10 days or the equivalent of a two week work week. Um, and it's $5,110 as a maximum if you're staying home because of, of something that you are dealing with. If you're dealing with a family member's illness uh, for the first two weeks, you get two thirds of your pay up to a maximum of $200. Um, and that's capped at $2,000 for that two week period. Um, there's also an additional 10 weeks for parents who have childcare that's closed or schools that are closed and they need to be home with kids because of that. What's important to note about this is that you don't get this benefit uh, if you just choose to stay home from work. Uh, if your, uh, your office is open and your business is in a critical sector. So if an employee says, you know, I just don't feel comfortable coming to work, uh, that's not enough. They have to fall within these other criteria. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So the, uh, the important thing about the kind of the, the uh, on the first Family First Coronavirus Response Act, a few points. Uh, employees must, uh, who take this leave are entitled to continue coverage under their employer's group health plan on the same terms. So you can't change things after the employer employees take this leave. Uh, and some of it's going to be pretty long. I mean, you're going to have employees that are off for uh, potentially 12 weeks, uh, potentially even a little bit longer than that if they're taking their own and then someone else's uh, uh, leave for someone else being ill. Uh, employees must be restored to their same uh, title and position uh, as they were before they started the leave. Uh, employers are required to re retain written documentation for four years. That's it, whether you granted the leave or whether you denied the leave. Um, and it's, it's important to note too that the amount of the pay, whether it's 100% or two thirds, uh, depending on their situation, is, is gonna be based on uh, the average earnings uh, for part-time employees. And also overtime, if it's anticipated, needs to be included in that, uh, in that payout. Uh, every dollar of this, and this is where the accountants um, are gonna play a role, every dollar uh, of the required paid leave, uh, plus the cost of the health insurance premiums for the leave, or during the leave, will be 100% covered by a tax credit. So this is something that is essentially uh, should be free or close to free for the employer. Uh, but there's an interesting caveat to this, and some people might say, well, I saw that there was an exemption for employers that were 50 or fewer, and I'm under 50, and I wanna see if I, I, I can claim this exemption. There has to be hardship of some kind, 
And when I look at this, the, a law like this, where there's a, a tax credit, um, it's gonna be harder to show that there's hardship if you are essentially getting a tax credit or fundable tax credit uh, for the amount of money that you're, you're paying your employees for this type of leave. Uh, next slide. There are notice requirements that go along with this. I know a lot of, of you have posters in your break rooms. Um, this is a new poster. Uh, you need to get it up if it's not up already. It's available on the Department of Labor's website. Uh, it, it needs to be posted in the workplace. And then if you're a, a larger employer, 50 or, or more, you can email it uh, or direct mail to employees. Uh, but again, the Department of Labor uh, website is a great resource and it includes uh, this poster. It's available there. Next slide. So one of the components of, of employment and in caring for your employees in this time uh, is unemployment insurance. And of course the Paycheck Protection Program wants you to keep your employees employed uh, for those eight weeks, paying them with essentially a forgivable loan. But if that's not possible, and, and if there, and there are some strategies where maybe unemployment uh, is gonna play a role as well as the Paycheck Protection Program, um, the, the Executive Order 20, uh, 2005 um, from Governor Walls uh, included a number of provisions that change how the un unemployment insurance program works in Minnesota uh, temporarily. So it suspended strict compliance with unemployment insurance laws. It sped up first payments. It expanded the categories of qualifying uh, conditions. So it includes things like uh, you're sick uh, or you're not sick, but you're immunocompromised uh, or you can't work because of an outbreak at work or you can't find care for your kids. Uh, if you're immunocompromised, uh, you might, uh, you're going to need to probably demonstrate that with a note from your doctor, but that's an unusual uh, categorization for an employee uh, to say, you know, I have asthma or I have a heart condition or have something that would cause me to be more likely to be affected by coronavirus um, than other employees. And under those circumstances, those employees could even uh, qualify for unemployment insurance. Uh, it's important to note too that the payments at, at this point for coronavirus type leave uh, or unemployment insurance are not gonna affect the employer's premiums uh, as they typically would if you just uh, terminated em an employee's uh, employment. So that's a, a benefit to employers. Um, there's also no five week limitation for uh, business owners. Uh, so that's taken away. There's also uh, some additional components where uh, the CARES Act has, has uh, provisions in it uh, at the federal level that are gonna supplement some of the state unemployment insurance benefits. So the federal pandemic emergency unemployment compensation uh, is 13 weeks of extended benefits. Um, this is something that the state is still working through. Uh, they don't have guidance quite yet. Uh, so some of these things are so new that even at the state level, they're not sure what to do uh, under these programs and they're waiting for further guidance from the federal government. There's also the federal pandemic unemployment assistance, which is very unique in that it allows people who would not otherwise be entitled to unemployment insurance to seek it. Uh, so that would include self-employed people, uh, independent contractors, clergy and farmers. Uh, and the state recommends that you apply if you fit into those categories, but they can't pay the benefits yet because they're still waiting for further guidance from the federal government. Um, next slide. So there was a very recent executive order on Monday um, that streamlined some additional things uh, adding to the prior executive order from, uh, from March. Uh, so employers must notify separated employees, that means employees who you're not allowing to come to work, um, that they can apply for unemployment benefits. Uh, there's no poster for this, you just need to notify them uh, that, they're, that they would uh, be entitled to or that they can seek unemployment benefits. And uh, DEED is no longer uh, requiring a delay in benefits uh, for people who are using some vacation or PTO or, or sick pay uh, to sort of cover a time uh, after they are uh, separated, formally separated from employment. So remember, and I would, and I would say that uh, I deal a fair amount with unemployment uh, insurance benefits and people who are on both sides of the equation and the appeals that go along with that. Uh, this is designed to protect people who are unemployed 
through no fault of their own. Uh, so if you quit your job, you don't qualify. Also, if you punch your boss in the nose um, and get fired, that's not gonna qualify. Um, there's uh, disqualification for gross employment misconduct and employment misconduct. So this, th this discussion all really focuses on COVID-19 and some of the additional protections that are provided, but there's still this underlying uh, system in place that is going to continue to operate uh, with some, some changes and modifications as discussed. Uh, next slide. So you also have the CARES Act, which uh, supplements state uh, unemployment benefits. So you have what we just described as the state level benefits, but now you have the CARES Act adding $600 per week for employees. Uh, and that is going to translate in some, into some additional dollars. Uh, for people who are curious, you know, can an employee survive on, on what they're going to be uh, receiving in unemployment insurance? A lot of employers are concerned about their employees and they care about this stuff. Um, but this, these calculations on this page uh, just generally show uh, $740 a week is the max you can get under state law. And that works out to half of your salary. So basically you receive about half of what your normal is and the maximum of that half can be $740 per week. If you, if you look at it, that works out to about a $76,000, uh, $77,000 salary. Um, and you get that for 26 weeks and the federal extension adds 13 weeks to that. So it's quite a long time that you can receive benefits under this, um, this combination of laws. The CARES Act adds $600 per week. So really, um, you, you could receive 100% of an equivalent salary to about $69,000, $70,000. Uh, so that's a pretty significant amount of money. Um, and I only note that because there are times when employers, go to the next slide, uh, employers are going to have conflicting uh, decisions to make. Do you keep your employees and do you pay them for eight weeks using the Paycheck Protection Program money, which is essentially a free salary or free wages? Or do you lay employees off, lose the Paycheck Protection Forgiveness, but the employees then have uh, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act where there are tax credits for employers? or they have the unemployment insurance benefits uh, with no tax penalty to employers. So there's some real hard decisions that employers need to make, and there's some dates that really matter uh, to your decision making. Uh, and you need to take a close look at the forgiveness elements of the Paycheck Protection Program. And in particular, when you need to have an employee hired back, uh, and, and when the cutoff is for making some of these uh, decisions to keep employees home. April 26 is, a creed, uh, is a, uh, an important date, and June 30 is, a, is an important date under the Paycheck Protection Program. Go to the next slide. So to protect your forgiveness uh, under the Paycheck Protection Program, everybody wants a really big loan, but everybody also wants that loan 100% forgiven because uh, we're not really uh, interested in borrowing money we have to pay back uh, in such a difficult time. And so how do you protect the forgiveness under the Paycheck Protection Program? Uh, well, what you need to do is you need to use the proceeds from your loan to pay employees during the eight weeks after getting the loan. So that's a pretty basic one. I think a lot of people know that. Um, and you, you should not use more than 25% of the loan funds for non-payroll expenses. So don't use more than 25% for uh, rent or utilities or a mortgage payment, uh, or, or you'll jeopardize the forgiveness potentially. You do need to bring employees back by June 30 of this year uh, for changes made between February 15 and April 26. So if you've let employees go uh, and the employees are not hired back by June 30, uh, and you've made those changes between February 15 and April 26, uh, you need to get the employees back on the payroll by June 30 in order to protect your, uh, your forgiveness. And do not decrease the employee headcount um, of full-time employees. Uh, you're gonna have a, a, a drop off in the forgiveness if, if you do that. Uh, and then do not increase salaries by more than 25, or decrease salaries by more than 25% for any employee uh, who made less than $100,000. So 
So for those of you making more than 100,000, um, you might be out of luck. Uh, the next slide. I wanted to address uh, two coronavirus in the workplace. Obviously social distancing is, a, is an obvious uh, thing you need to be doing. Uh, but in this environment, uh, over communicate with employees. Employees are more separated. They're working from home. They're remote. They're not seeing their, their coworkers on a regular basis. They need to hear from employers. They need to know that employers are taking care of them uh, and taking care of the business because everybody cares about whether they're gonna have a job when this is all over. And it will be over at some point here. Uh, succession planning, uh, review your plan. Uh, make sure that if some key person is no longer available for the next two weeks uh, and is not able to work, uh, that person uh, is, is not a, uh, gonna kill your business in the meantime. Um, test uh, employees if, if you have concerns. The EEOC, which is the federal level, allows you to get a thermometer reading. And they prefer uh, non-contact thermometers. Uh, given the potential direct threat to others who could be exposed to the virus. So this is not a normal thing, it's not usual. We've got a link to the flu uh, page and the guidance from the EEOC. Uh, they've updated the flu pandemic to include COVID-19, uh, so it covers more than just the flu now. And uh, you'd, you'd be kind of surprised that the level of invasive testing you can do as an employer if you have real concerns about uh, whether someone should be at work. Uh, you can ask about symptoms. Do you have a fever? Are you experiencing shortness of breath? And if the employee says they are, then you send the employee home. You need to keep the records confidential. You need to keep test results confidential. Um, and you can't tell everyone, hey, uh, John had or has coronavirus, but what you should be doing is if John had contact with employees at the office, you should warn those employees that they were exposed. Uh, next slide. Um, there's a lot of confusion around HIPAA uh, and HIPAA compliance, uh, but most of you are not medical uh, providers, healthcare providers, uh, so it really doesn't apply to you. Uh, employers are governed by the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, employers can ask employees if they have tested positive for coronavirus. Um, if someone is, uh, is infected, uh, they should isolate at home. They shouldn't come back. There are protections for them under the Family First Coronavirus Response Act. Uh, the same is, is true if they have a sick family member at home. Um, and don't punish them for, for this in any way. Uh, don't retaliate uh, for this kind of behavior. And when, you, when they come back, uh, put them in the same position they were in before. Um, and respond to the infection. If there's someone in the office who's in, infected, their work area should be disinfected, cleaned, uh, and should not be occupied for 24 hours or longer, and just follow the CDC guidance on this. Uh, and now is not the time to uh, demand a doctor's note and demand full documentation. If someone has a cough, if someone is not feeling well, uh, that, that should be enough for you to be able to send them home uh, and allow them to go home. Uh, there will be time and there are times, uh, days or uh, a few days later when documentation can be obtained, uh, but this is a difficult time for healthcare providers and some of these doctor's notes may not be readily available to employees. And with the daily uh, changes in this virus, you don't want to hold them to a strict standard. Um, Next slide. There are employees that are working from home uh, that are hourly, and this uh, should be a concern for you more than more so than uh, salaried employees. Uh, hourly employees are entitled to breaks, they're entitled to lunch, and you need to keep track of their hours while they're out of the office. Um, this is important not just for keeping track and making sure they take breaks, but also making sure they don't work overtime. Uh, employees are very dedicated to their employment and to their employers. And what we don't want is people uh, spending more than their, uh, their usual workday at home, uh, but not keeping track of it. That's, a, that's a, a bad scenario going forward and could, could have repercussions um, in terms of lawsuits for large employers if they don't do a good job of keeping these, these records down. Hazard pay, if you pay hazard pay, uh, it may have implications uh, for overtime. So if you increase someone's rate of pay, 
uh, make sure that you're accurately reflecting that it's hazard pay and not part of a regular uh, wage increase for the employee. Uh, if you're reducing an, an hourly employee's wages, uh, for large employers, uh, it's $10 an hour. Uh, that's the Minnesota minimum wage uh, as of January 1. Um, so make sure you don't reduce their wages below the minimum wage. Uh, and if you have payroll questions, talk to your payroll uh, provider. They're a great resource in this context around some of these wage and hour questions. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, could I be sued? I know in any, any uh, injury lawsuit um, like this, you have liability questions and you have damages questions. COVID-19 is very difficult to track be because uh, it is sometimes uh, it's not showing itself uh, until days later. And so it's difficult for an employee to show or prove that they contracted the virus while they were at work. Um, the damages are, you know, the reality is that some people do, do die. Um, they have significant damages or their families do, uh, but most people recover. Um, the bigger question is, you know, are you being reasonable? OSHA says that uh, each employer has to furnish uh, to each of his employees employment and a place of employment which are free from recognized hazards that are causing or likely to cause death or serious physical harm to employees. There is some risk that if an employee is put in a compromised position and, not, uh, and, and reasonable safeguards are not taken, to protect the employee from COVID-19 or contact like that, um, that an employer could face some risk. Um, Walmart has already been sued after one of its employees um, contracted COVID-19 and died. Um, and so the lawsuits will come, uh, but exercise good judgment. And if you think about it, if you put the safety uh, and uh, health of your employees and your customers first, and you work backwards from there, uh, you come to a lot of, of, of good measures and protections that can be used uh, and, and will be very effective in combating any argument in the future uh, that your company should be held liable if someone contracts this virus. Uh, and with that, I think we're done and we'll open it up for questions. Matthew, thank you so much. We do have a few questions. I'm going to pull them up here. So what steps may an employer, uh, employer take when an employee uh, defiantly ignores company directions to stay in place and not travel to known COVID hotspots? I think like, like any, it, it's, I'm not sure about the context for that, um, but the, like anything, if you have concerns that the employee is, uh, is disregarding uh, social distancing, is traveling different places, um, it, it's, it's, that's a difficult question, but it's probably one where uh, that employee should be isolated at the office, isolated at work. Uh, and, and also, you know, there, there may be circumstances where if they're exhibiting, uh, they could be tested on a regular basis. So some of the testing that I referred to, uh, most employees are probably not going to need that, but some employees might need to be asked these hard questions. Uh, where have you traveled? What have you done? I need to take your temperature. Um, keeping track and monitoring those people. It's kind of an unusual circumstance for somebody who doesn't care about their own health. Um, but uh, use good judgment. And, you know, if the, if the employee needs to be sent home, uh, you know, potentially want to do the best thing for your employees, your other employees. And, uh, you know, so I guess there are, there are potential risks of of sending them home and keeping them at work. And if you are more concerned about their, their health uh, and, and the health of your employees, uh, sending them home may be, uh, may be something that you could think about. I probably wanna know more about the situation before, uh, <laughs> before somebody relies on that, uh, that comment, but that's, <laughs> that's an interesting question. It is. So one of the questions that we've been getting and fielding on our end is, I've got employees that are afraid to come in and work. What do I do about them? I think what you do with the employee who uh, is afraid to come into work, uh, you have options to allow them to stay at home. Um, you have, you know, unpaid leave, but a lot of us need our employees in order to continue to uh, make money during this crisis and to continue to function. What, what I think, you know, the best strategy in those circumstances are you can pay hazard pay if you think the employee is, um, is exposed to more 
you know, a lot of these grocery stores and a lot of different uh, employers are, are using hazard pay as an incentive to employees who are very reluctant to leave their homes. Um, you can also really make it clear to employees through communication what, te what steps you're taking to clean, to disinfect, and to make sure that the workplace is as safe as it possibly can be. So can you do us a favor and kind of take that one step further? Because you've got both an employee who could considerably be vulnerable, but maybe not have what a doctor would consider. So it's like my personal opinion is this is what I think I am. So I think I'm vulnerable. And you've got an employer who's a critical, a critical employer saying, we need you to work so you can use hazard pay. Does it come to a point, uh, Matthew, in your opinion, where an employer needs to kind of use, and I really appreciated that you mentioned this, that kind of that underlying system of, of how you manage employees through the process, regardless of this pandemic? So what was the, the specific question? <laughs> so take the same thing that you just shared and talk about, take it one step further and say an employee doesn't, isn't willing to come into work, hazard pay doesn't work. Now you've got an employer that's concerned about maintaining if they've applied for and received funding for PPP. Now th this employee may not come back to work for whatever reason. So it's kind of a balance of two of your slides. What is an employer gonna do and how do they make hard choices based on a system that's already in place for an employee that isn't willing to work and the employee's right to make a choice on their own? It really, in, in some cases, I think this PPE uh, program is still developing and you need to look at, um, you need to look at the, the forgiveness guidance as it continues to come out. Right. Some employees might be able to be paid to sit at home for eight weeks. Um, I think the program is, is designed to make sure that people still have income coming in. Now, they can also be given leave, uh, and that leave is going to presume to be involuntary under the governor's order, uh, the 2005 order. But that, that involuntary leave would put them in a position where uh, they can then seek a, a note from a doctor and, and get that uh, proof, to get the proof they need that they're immunocompromised. If they are not uh, immunocompromised, if they just don't feel comfortable coming to work and they choose not to come to work, there's going to be, uh, there are consequences for that. Uh, so it, there's not a situation where you could just choose, hey, I don't want to come to work and um, I'm not going to go to work. If you're in a position where you need to uh, tell an employee, hey, I need you to come to work. And if you don't come to work uh, and you, you're, not, you're not sick, you're, not, uh, you're in a critical sector, uh, discipline still occurs in this context. And failure to show up for work is still something that you can discipline an employee for. But it's a sensitive area. And so you need to exercise good judgment and, and don't leap to the termination or the you know, separation from employment. Uh, as the first thing you choose uh, in this discussion. Well, on that note, we are at the 8.30 mark. And so, Ma Matthew, I just want to say thank you again for sharing your time and your information with us. It has been exceedingly enlightening and very valuable. And I'm super grateful that you were t you're kind enough to share your time and talents with us today. Just a quick reminder, these webinars are provided in partnership with Dakota County CD and Chambers. We've got three more up. We're going to switch gears from some technical business stuff this Friday, talking about how business businesses that have historically been retail, move online, and continue to engage their customers, even the most difficult. We're going to switch back to more technical conversation on April 13th, next Monday, talking about some of the key things even that uh, Matthew has identified from a tax perspective on Monday, and then again a little bit more on the marketing and sales on the April 15th. About Open to Business, we are a nonprofit that's contracted by the seven metro counties to provide free business consulting and gap financing. The recording of the seminar will be shared with the county partners and posted on their websites. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope you have a good day. Take care.